Okay, let's get going on this. Now, first, I want to thank, and please convey this to Heather. I want to thank Heather and Richland College for having us here. We've been here for 18 months now. They said 18 years. Okay, every month for 18 months. And they've been very nice hosts, et cetera, gave us a room and all that stuff. And, Everything's been good, so. But we're moving to the Russell Planetarium next month. And the first one at the Russell Planetarium in Mesquite is gonna be on September the 3rd, Saturday, September the 3rd. Saturday. It, de okay. it's, it had to depend on when the staff could come in and open it up. So it's not gonna be on a Friday night okay. all the time. You got to look at the task calendar to find out, and what you where you find that is go to texasastro.org, and at the top of the page there's a calendar, and you click that and you can see what it's going to be. Okay, but we'll be over at the Russell Planetarium starting next month. And they're going to have planetarium show, and we're going to have a lecture, beginner astronomy class, right across the hall from the planetarium. And then we'll set up telescopes outside in the back of the planetarium. So, weather permitting, of course. If it's cloudy, we'll just not be able to do that. Yeah, we may have okay, let's get going. Today we're going to try to go over these subjects that are on the up on the screen right now, and if you've never heard of what that is, we're going to try to teach you that today, some of the basics of what right ascension and declination is. I've written a couple of notes over here on the left-hand side of the board that you need to understand a little bit about. Okay, so let's start with the first note I wrote up there. The North Star, Polaris. First, it's not the brightest star in the sky, regardless if your teacher told you that or not, okay? In fact, Joe cannot see the North Star because my eyes are too bad. I've got cataracts. It's about second magnitude or so, a little, little less than sec second magnitude, and I can't see second magnitude stars without cataracts, so I can't see the North Star, so it's not very bright. All right, but to find it, look at that page I gave you on how to find the North Star. All you got to do is find the Big Dipper, the two stars on the end of the bucket point directly to the North Star. So if you can see the Big Dipper, you can find the North Star. It'll point right to it. Not very far away. A little bit away, but not very far. Okay, so you can find the North Star. Well, that's a key star if you have, if you're trying to do right ascension and declination. Is if you can't find the North Star by any means, well, you might as well forget about using that kind of a mount that's set up there. You can forget it. All right? Now, you don't have to be perfect for visual observing. Let me just add that. For visual observing, all you got to do is kind of line it up north. Kind of. Sort of, kind of. And I showed him, John Rudd showed, showed him last time we were at Rockwall how he did, how he lines up his scope. He goes, Joe, which way is north? Uh, right over the top of that tree. Boom. Okay. I'm finished. It just kind of points at it. <laughs> that's all he does. All right, that's good enough for visual observing. And we'll get into more detail in that in a minute. But if you don't take pictures, it has to be perfect. So you're going to spend an hour lining up the scope and focusing. It's about an hour, all right? If you're going to take pictures. So caution beginners. Do not say, hey, I want to get, I want to do astrophotography. Have you ever owned a scope? No. <laughs> well, 
best thing for you to do is to do visual observing for one year and read all about it. And don't buy one of those kind of mounts. Don't buy one of those kind of mounts as your very first mount ever. Okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit about what we mean with right ascension and declination. Astronomers like to change things. You know, they, every industry, and I, astronomy is an industry, has to have its own jargon, you know, to make it more confusing. Accountants like to do that too. You know, balance sheet, you know, income statement, you know, they make up these words. To, Debit credit. Yeah. As <laughs> yeah. opposed to plus minus. Yeah. Right. Right ascension and declination means there is very similar to longitude and latitude. They, in fact, they could have used longitude and latitude, and it, we would have all known what they were talking about. Okay? So don't let those words confuse you. Right ascension is very similar to longitude on a map, and declination is latitude on a map. So if we look at this little thing on here, the ancients didn't have our understanding of what was up in the sky. Okay, it was points of light. And that point of light showed up at exactly the same time on that day, 365 days later. All right, so they were all pinned to a sphere that circled the earth. It was all around the earth, out in the sky, a sphere. So the, here's the earth, here's the celestial sphere all around the earth, and those objects are pinned to the inside of that sphere and they're given a longitude and latitude of right ascension and declination that does not change. It moves, but the RA and deck is the same. Okay? It does not change. It's at a specific location on that celestial sphere. Meanwhile, we're spinning under Meanwhile, we're spinning underneath it and yes, it moves across the sky because we're, we're rotating, all right? But the RA and deck location, look, Polaris, which doesn't move, sort of. It moves a little bit in a little teeny tiny circle, all right? Little teeny tiny. Look at its uh, declination. Should be 90 degrees if it was directly over the North Celestial Pole. If it was directly over the North Celestial Pole, it would have a declination of 90 degrees. So how does that fit in with this scope over here? Well, it's got some marks on it. It's got some marks up here. Hey, one of them says 90 degrees. So, when I adjust the deck to the latitude, Dallas, 32.5 degrees north latitude, when this angle is 32.5 degrees perfectly, if this, and this is rotated perfectly, it's going to point to the North Celestial Pole, which is very nearby Polaris, three quarters of one degree away. For all intents and purposes, if you got Polaris in that telescope mounted on top of that mount, you're plenty good for visual observing. Plenty good but not good enough for astrophotography because you've got to be exactly where the sky rotates, which is three quarters of a degree away from the North Star. 
It's not the North Star is not exactly on the North Celestial Pole. Not quite. You're lucky though if you were in the southern hemisphere, they don't have anything to find the South Celestial Pole. You'd be out of luck. There's a few dim stars there that they kind of do a star hop with to get over there, but they don't have a star that's darn near right there on it already. <clears throat> now, I need to talk just a minute, and I hope I don't confuse you, about a thing called procession. Procession. You'll hear, if you go out and buy a star chart, you might hear somebody say, I wonder if, what date that star chart was written. What were they worried about? Well, the stars process across the sky very slowly. The planets are even worse, okay? Much quicker they process because this axis rotates, this Earth rotates like a top every 22,000 years. Rotates around. In 15,000 years, Vega will be the North Star because that pole will be pointed at Vega, not Polaris. Okay, so when you hear astronomers talk about precession, they're talking about how this axis will change over a long period of time. Okay, so imagine all the objects in the sky, the Messier objects, the NGC objects, all pinned to the inside of this globe. Okay? Got that in your mind? There's some other terms. They make it hard. They could have done this in degrees instead of hours, but since it takes the Earth 24 hours to turn completely around one time, they wrote it in hours. The Earth turns 15 degrees every hour. So in 24 hours, it turns 360 degrees. Okay, so when they wrote this, instead of putting like we did longitude marks, they put hours, minutes, and seconds around this celestial equator. What is that? That's the equator of the Earth stretched out into space. That's all. The equator of the Earth stretched out into space is the celestial equator. And so what they did was they put hours, minutes, and seconds all around that celestial equator. So Stop thinking of them as hours, minutes, and seconds, and start thinking of them as distance around the celestial equator. Distance around. So, obviously, 10 hours of right ascension is not as far around as 20 hours or 15 hours. The bigger the number, the further around you go. Well, where is zero? That would be my question. Where is zero? Where's the start? It starts at an arbitrary point. Then a bunch of guys got, and girls got together and they decided that zero was going to be where the sun rose on the celestial equator on the vernal equinox in March. And wherever that the sun rises, on the equator, on the vernal equinox, is RA0. <coughs> Just like Greenwich Mean Time is where time starts. It's the same concept. They had to pick a spot. They could have picked Dallas, Texas. You know, time starts in Dallas, Texas. doesn't start in Greenwich. All right? But that's where they picked, and that's where the time is laid out. Well, same thing for this. They just pick that event for RA equals zero. Okay? And then right ascension 
increases as you go around. All right? Altitude or declination is simply latitude. It works just like latitude. Lines of declination plus 10, plus 20, all the way up to 90. Minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, minus 40, minus 50. Minus 90. Okay? Latitude and longitude. That's all it is. Except it's on a fake sphere that encircles the earth outside. How far can you see um, detonation? I mean, well, would, you'd have to go start figuring out the curvature of the earth. Right, right. That's what I was saying. Now, you know, you can't, you if can't. you were on the equator, Well, I don't know if you could see 90 degrees plus or minus. I don't know if you could see all the way to 90. I don't know. I don't think you could. Not unless you were on a mountain. Uh, on a mountaintop, maybe. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> now, there's a couple of other coordinates that can be used with a different type of mount. Altitude azimuth. Alt as. An alt as mouth. I don't have one here. You got one. Alt as. All right. And I'm building a setting circle right now. Yeah. So that's altitude as a mouth. That's just another coordinate system. And if you download Stellarium, the planetarium program, it's free. Stellarium.org. Put it on your computer. You can see. Either RA and depth or altitude azimuth for any object that you click on. It just shows it in the upper left hand corner. <clears throat> Alright, shows both for you. Oh, I already called it silly jargon. That's what it is, it's longitude and latitude. So let's go over some of these terms. The North Celestial Pole and the South Celestial Pole. Just the North and South Pole extended into space. That's all that is. Not the magnetic pole. <laughs> no. The, yeah, right. Not the magnetic. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in a minute. Just one, because we're going to try to show them on this one how to line it up a little bit. We'll show them that. Uh, the celestial equator, just imagine a rubber band around the equator and you stretch it out into outer space. That's the celestial equator. Okay. Horizon is just, depends on your location. What the horizon? That's your question. Zenith is wherever you are. Straight up. Wherever you're standing, where's Zenith? Right there. Meridian. Oh man, this is a good term for astrophotographers. They worry about the meridian. Why do they worry about the meridian? Because those types of telescopes cannot cross the meridian very far without the tube running into the mountain and damaging it, the motors will stop and everything else. So they got to know where the meridian is. All right, so just, I wrote it down. The line that extends from the north point on the horizon upwards through the zenith down to the south. So if you just look at Polaris, say that's Polaris right where that wall, okay, and I just go like this. That's the meridian. So, and if you have one of these types of telescopes that's motorized, it cannot cross that. Some of them will cross it just a little bit without a problem. But if you like went to sleep and it crossed the meridian, you'd wake up and all your motors would be fried. It would jam itself into the mount and everything, your motors would burn up and everything else. You've actually got to flip the telescope, do a meridian flip, 
That's what they call it. Meridian flip and get going the other way. Lloyd and I don't worry about that because we have altitude azimuth type scopes. We don't have to worry about meridian or nothing. Okay. Some more stuff. And some of this I've already mentioned. Uh, remember, RA, right ascension, very similar to longitude on Earth. The right ascension <coughs> of an object is measured along the celestial equator, just like longitude is measured on a map. The same thing. Same as it. So if you get a GPS coordinate, You've got a right ascension declination coordinate. So same concept. Just using different ways of measuring the distance. Hours. Okay, there you go. 24 equal portions. We mentioned that. Remember the sky moves 15 degrees every hour. So in 24 hours, it moves 360 degrees. Uh, by convention, they just decided that's where it was going to be. All right. All right. And deck is like latitude. Which falls on the west side of the square? Huh? Mm -hmm. Which falls on the west side of the square? Right. Zero line. Zero line. Yeah. <laughs> This is probably one of the best, uh, what would you call it, pictures of illustrating right ascension and declination. So let's take just a minute and look at this. You can see these are going up, plus 90, minus 90. And here's your hours da -da 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 going around. The bigger the hour, the further around it is. And Dallas, you remember Dallas is 32 degrees north, 96 degrees west. That's, that's really saying the same thing, but in hours. And the Earth sets in the middle here and spins around. And all those objects are pinned somewhere on this grid, just like on a map grid. see if I can turn the lights on. There we go. I took a little screenshot. And this is what I was talking about. If you pick an object in Stellarium, this program called Stellarium, up here it'll tell you the RA, the deck, and uh, altitude and azimuth of that object. You see? A lot of people say, well, how do I find out? Well, that's how you find out. If you got an iPad, you can just look on the iPad and get the coordinates. And then, of course, if you have a go-to scope and you know those coordinates, every go-to scope, you can enter the right ascension declination or the altitude azimuth in some of them. Normally, it's RA and DEC. And go to it. That's really all you need to know on a go-to scope is the RA and the DEC. You just punch it in. Of course, you know, a lot of objects are already listed, so you're kind of wasting your time. But if you can't find it in the hand controller, if you can find the RA and DEC, you can enter it and go to it. All right, practical uses. And Bill is doing this right now, I think can be used with accurate setting circles to find objects in the sky. However, most scopes do not have very accurate setting circles. can be used with a planetarium program. We talked about that. And the meridian is used on certain amounts so you don't run into it. And Bill is doing this right now. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was thinking of bringing the unassembled parts tonight, but the, the paint was still, still there, still drying. Well, here's, a, here's what we call a Dobsonian telescope. It's a reflector. 
it's probably the best bang in the buck for beginners. You get a big aperture scope cheap. So the dot setting it up is, is <laughs> yeah, and setting up is real easy. But the problem for beginners is finding things. Objects in the sky are real small and dim, and the scope has to be pointed directly at them, or you will see nothing. That's every scope. Yes, every <laughs> scope. <laughs> you will see nothing. <laughs> All right. So yeah. to help you, yes. yeah. to help you, yeah. there's some do-it-yourself projects where you can get a little setting circle made, 360 degrees. That's equivalent of mine. And a, and a uh, altitude indicator Why? made, alt azimuth. Mm -hmm. All, all altitudes, azimuth, and then you can look stuff up. Now look how big this setting circle is. It's got all kind of marks on it. It's huge. Okay, got lots of marks. So now you can look that thing up in there and say, well, it's at. 270.5 degrees and 40 degrees up, 41 degrees up. And you can just point the scope to that. So the Dobsonians don't usually come with anything. No, they don't. It's a cheap upgrade. Cheap upgrade. And those and batteries are wired. Yeah. 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 And there's all kind of plans on the internet for how to do so this. To level it. And uh, any print so, shop, there's some PDF files that you can download for free off the internet. You take it to a printer, and he'll print this for you. Well, there are a couple of websites you can buy them pre made. Yeah. Which I do. Yeah. Okay. Red, your red flashlight and your glasses. There's just another way of doing it. Look, great big numbers. You yeah, can go. A lot of guys will put a red light right here, shining down here, so that they can see it at night. Battery operated red light. Yeah. Do you have to uh, polar line them? Do you have to point? Yeah, you yeah. got to get initially get it. Yeah. North. That's all. Not north. Line. All right. Yeah. But that's, you know. That's just the compass. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some other tricks with it. Instead of doing the altitude with little marks, you can buy one of these for $39. $29. It's got, well, that's just from 39 Called a Wixie. And they use it for uh, cutting wood. You know, it measures the angle. So, it measures the altitude. Angle. It's got two little magnets on it, and if you happen to have a metal tube daub, it just sticks on there with those magnets. And it's accurate, I have been told, to a tenth of a degree. Harper Freight sounds like a 27 knots. Yeah. So, you can just run out. Now, there's your altitude. That's going to be perfect. Then you just put that those numbers around the bottom, and there you go. I used that. Poor I man's uh, push to. Poor man's push to scope. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Yeah. You were going to. See, I attended a yeah. star party where the visibility was good, but not great because we were still near Dallas. And there were a few people like with their push tubes. They were looking up this and they were looking up that. I couldn't figure out how they did it so fast. <laughs> they were using their little little uh, iPhone yeah. type things to get their targets yeah, coordinates, and then they just spun, spun it into around. the scope. I mean, a couple of times at the same party, I was right on. I find an object and bam, right in the middle. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. The poor man's are going up. There's a little device on the uh, screen right now called a Telrad. And all it is is a heads up display. A little red light, red light in here with a target, and it shines it up on this piece of plastic. And when you look through here, you see this projected on the sky. Like a heads up display. They're not very expensive, 39 bucks. About. Yeah. About thirty-nine dollars. 
And you know, you can screw this base into the scope or you can use a 3M stick tape, you know, that they foam sticky tape. And you can just stick it on there. That's what I do. When it falls off eventually, a couple of years later, you get dental tape, dental floss, and you run it underneath the stuff that's stuck all over the scope and it comes off. Or just put dental floss. Or fishing line. Comes off. So I stick them on and about every year or two. I learned something, yeah. I'll be out I'll be out in the field and it'll fall on the ground. Let's put screws in. Okay, the key thing with this device is these are known, the circles are of known size. So the outside circle is four degrees, and the inside circle is two degrees. All right, so you can use this device to star hop around the sky because it's, this is always four degrees. Is the center one? Yeah. Okay. But you could star hop around with that. And what else is cool is that all over the internet, there's free Telrad, that's what that is, free Telrad star charts. That's the thing. All over the internet. You can go download them and put them in plastic, put them in a binder. Tons of them out there. And here's one of them. <clears throat> Look, they got a little tail rats drawn on there just kind of to show you what it will look like, you know. So that's a tail rat chart. This was just something I had I, on my computer and I just copied the picture, you know. I had it on my computer. But you can buy the entire sky as a tail rat chart. Uh, not buy, but just download. It's free. Well, sometimes they have these overlays you can just put over yeah. existing maps. Right. Yeah. There is the actual one for all the Messier objects. You want to write that down. CusterObservatory.org docs Messier 1 PDF. That will give you all the Messier objects. Yeah. Can I ask a question? What's messy object? Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Let me just finish this one okay. Do a Google search for Telrad star chart and a whole bunch of them will come up. Let me write this down. Okay, what is a messy object? <clears throat> it's a catalog it's an of 110 objects in the sky. And back in the 17th century, a fellow by the name of Charles Chuck Messier. <laughs> Charles Messier, old Chuck. He was looking for comets. And in Texas we say Messier. <laughs> he was looking for comets because you could be real famous if you found comets back then. He lived in Paris. And every time he's a French guy. Every time. He found something that was not a comet. Hey, this is a comet. He would make a note of it in his log. So, typical French guy, he made a list of things not to look at. All right? And we look at them all the time because they're very beautiful objects in the sky. All right? And there's 110 of them. And it's a catalog called the Messier Catalog. And on star charts, It'll be the letter M with a number. If you Google that number, you'll get a picture of it. M one one or O one. Then you get a number. So you'll get a picture of it. Okay. There's a couple of other charts that are real famous. The NGC. You'll see that on the chart. NGC seventy nine hundred. No, uh, ain't that big. <laughs> 1501. 1501, there we go. There's about 7,000 or so. Yeah, about 7,000. Yeah, uh, NGC objects. And a guy by the name of J.L. Dreyer in the late 1800s. 
went around and stole everybody's catalog that he could find. Oh, you got one here. You got one here. You got one here. And he created the new general catalog. And then they came out with a camera that took a photograph. And about 15 years later, he came out with two more catalogs. Index catalog number one and index catalog number two are IC with a number. So on Star, that's the three most popular ones you're gonna see on star charts. Messier objects, NGC objects, IC objects. Any questions? Y'all are experts on RA and depth now. And a celestial sphere. A celestial sphere. I have a question. Um, if you are uh, taking uh, some pictures or doing astrophotography, yeah. as you're moving across the sky, I mean, in France, so it's obviously slow, but if, if you're going to do a long exposure, won't the object turn? In an alt as mount, yes, it's called field rotation, and it sets in in about one minute. Okay. At the most. <laughs> Normally, you only get 30 seconds before field rotation sets in if you use an alt as scope. That's an equatorial mount. That's the advantage of an equatorial. That's the advantage. That will track it longer. <clears throat> Most of the imagers don't, what do you say, Andy, about they take 20 minute subs at the most because they're afraid something's going to happen and ruin the image, you know. They take 15 or 20 minute subs because you take a chance. You know, a meteor could go through it, an airplane could fly through it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you go really